We're in St. James Park in London, England today, and we're with my friend Mario Lamont Barnes, a law professor from UC Irvine who's an expert on constitutional law. Um, Mario, I've been thinking so much uh, with um, people's attitudes about gun control. I've been thinking a lot about the work that you did on to stand your ground laws. And just what, what it was that you learned about guns and the American psyche from that work. So I guess the, the thing I would take away is people really do in some ways dissociate gun ownership from the notion of gun violence, which um, makes little sense to me. But so when people talk about gun ownership, they talk about it as a right, a vested interest, something um, which shouldn't be disturbed, almost you know, for some group of people as if it's sacrosanct. But then when you think about the related issues of gun violence, they somehow place gun ownership to one side and talk about sort of regulations of behaviors, um, acting as if if you somehow regulate behavior appropriately, um, then there wouldn't be gun violence irrespective of, of the rights we create around gun ownership. And what I would like to tell them is, but if you look about the regulations we do for that behavior, Stand Your Ground was a set of laws that took standard self-defense, which should have been, I could use, you know, a response and sometimes violently when people threaten me with force, and expand it to allow for us to use much more force in many more situations. So if you marry the notion of ownership <laughs> leading to a space of, um, you know, leading to gun violence because the behavioral sort of controls are not there, stand your ground did, did much more to erase any sort of control. So we have now all of these messages around, I have a huge, you know, and protected right to own and have a weapon, but in the same time, the law has made it much more easy um, and in some ways lawful um, for me to use violence, including up through and including lethal violence, which could involve guns, um, in a way that I think is counter yeah, well, so productive. Ironic yeah. to think that, that just something that the law does, it actually promotes violence instead of inhibits it or limits it. Yeah, Stand Your Ground was, I mean, at, at bottom, critics that I agree with them, was about expanding your opportunity to respond with violent force to a set of circumstances much broader than historically had been available to you. Um, if you partner that with greater availability of guns and, and people having a mindset, I have a right to have my gun, um, then any notion of being confronted with something that you think um, is a dangerous situation produces an opportunity, right, for people then um, who are carrying, concealed or not, um, uh, to say I felt threatened and needed to use uh, guns. And as when we talked about this before, what I told you about was the way in which there were racialized and socialized yeah, aspects exactly. to this in terms of both who the victims are and then who's able to allege successfully a stand your ground defense. And so, but those are aside to the, the question you just yeah, had. For me, they're central. Yeah. It, 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 um, it, makes, it makes people of color less safe in America. Oh, absolutely. Especially when you think that of the large number of stereotypes uh, around black and brown men where they are perceived um, as more threatening, right? So the, the very fact of being living in my skin um, and walking down the street uh, means that someone uses violence and says, well, I was afraid of him because right. of who he was and, and how he looked, whether I was presenting, you know, in my own mind as, as particularly menacing or dangerous um, comes into play, which yeah. is, um, again, the statistics suggest that people are much more inclined um, to view certain uh, types of people um, as potentially violent. And then if you give them the opportunity to use force earlier than would historically be available, yeah. it's a problem. I, I just taught a course on international hum humanitarian law and law of armed conflict, and one of the things we talk about is anticipatory self-defense, right? This notion of being able to use um, violence in anticipation of being subject. Yeah. And to me, that's what Stand Your Ground promoted, right? This notion of, oh, I view you as threatening. So before you've actually even done anything that looks historically like, you know, presenting uh, uh, a situation where you're threatening violence against me, uh, I can take action. And again, we've broadened the circumstance under which the law is willing and able to facilitate or accommodate um, ever broadening uses um, or ever increasing uses of violence. I, I think probably a lot of people are asking you questions about the recent Supreme abortion, oh, Court abortion. Yeah. So what are you telling like family and friends, like non-legal experts or students? You know, you know what's going on? It's, it's very puzzling for, for somebody who's just yeah, an ordinary person. I have person. a harder time with it. I mean, there's always been a world in which the Supreme Court uh, has had opportunity and on occasion reversed itself uh, on certain types of opinions. Like, And some of that has been good, right? We, I think we think that the Brown versus a Board yeah, of Education right, exactly. reversal of Plessy, Plessy versus, versus Ferguson um, is, a, is an improvement. But um, I don't know that we've ever had 
this type of reversal in two ways. On an issue that was so politically freighted um, in, in, a, in an evenly divided way in terms of the social context. And I don't know that we've ever had a reversal in the context of substantive due process where what we have said is something that we have deemed to be a liberty protected interest now being uh, treated as if it no longer is, right? Which is to say the Roe decision and Casey after it, which sort of updated Roe, were about an understanding of that right to choose belonging to an area of privacy um, where the court, based on what we call a penumbric view, looking across the Constitution, sees that even though there's no explicit um, sort of endorsement, that if you look across what is held important in the Constitution, um, that that um, type of privacy is something that's found in numerous places where the court in a case called Griswold, which was a contraception case, said that um, should be respected and that before the, the government should encroach, um, it should have a really, really important reason and it should do so in a very limited fashion. And so we have never had them sort of revisit and decide that something that belonged to the protected group of liberty interests, like the right to marry, yeah. like the right to vote, like these privacy rights, um, uh, were on further reflection not protected. Um, and so I think that holds huge consequences for the right to choose um, and deeply upsets public health um, and you know women's safety. But it also now threatens, in a larger way, what we might think about as substantive due process and liberty rights, right? Which is why many people were very upset with the Clarence Thomas concurrence, because he seemed to suggest we could then go back and relook at other cases rooted in privacy, like Griswold, which is contraception, like Lawrence versus Texas, which yeah. sort of embraced an, a, a, a protection of, of intimacy to include between gay partners, right? right? So right, exactly. like those things could be revisited. And then he even said the marriage cases, right? And marriage doesn't belong to that group of privacy protected uh, interests. Marriage is its own separate protected liberty right, interests, right. like the right to vote, like the right to make medical decisions for yeah. yourself. So he seemed to be opening the door to the court going back and revisiting these things and I'll come back to my first point. This is more problematic given now that I think people are much more understanding of the political sort of element or nature to the court's decision, right? Which is that you know, we used to think, well, conservative justice is as, as bound by a liberal one, by the text and right. by certain things. But it seems what we've learned from the Dobbs decision um, is that the current court um, is willing to act on its conservatism in a way that upsets sort of previous um, areas that we might have thought would not be disturbed, right? Which is, so n everything is on the table for reconsideration. Uh, not just things that have been traditionally um, uh, sort of problematic, like affirmative action or gun rights. Yeah. But, but now we are, we're in a world, this new world of 14th Amendment, reimagining what liberty protections we have. That makes me very nervous, right? We've all, I've, I often have written about equal protection as being the problematic area of the 14th Amendment yeah. because what is equality can be very different. But we, we thought we were on solid ground with the understanding of how substantive due process works. Once something is declared to be a protected liberty interest, the what follows it is a pretty high standard um, for the government before it can intrude upon it. Now that that's opened up for reconsideration, um, it's going to be an interesting and perhaps difficult time to, to be a constitutional scholar or to be someone who cares about um, or thinks about rights as something that are somehow stable. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that the church is deeply connected with, deeply concerned about. And I do, I just worry so much about friends of mine who are, who are gay people who are married. I, I worry about all, the, all these other possibilities that, um, that we may be in a, a, just a very retrograde, backward moving moment in our Oh, in our I agree. I, I worry about women of color and poor yeah, women, yeah. right? And now that geography will control um, choices. I mean, there, I was reading a, a, a case in the paper today about um, a 10 year old who has a pregnancy as a re uh, right. result of I a sexual that. assault yes, um, in Ohio mm -hmm. and the state mm -hmm. suggesting that under the, the recent change to the law precipitated by the Supreme Court um, opinion that that, that, short, that child and their family could be forced mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to now bring that child to term. And I just, I, f I feel like that type of dismissive and in some ways insensitive yeah, yeah. treatment of a very personal right. um, and, and um, 
uh, you know, problem and, and trouble for which normally the family would have a broader set of choices that that law would respect yeah. um, is, is what you're going to see much more often, right? Yeah. Which is people having many fewer choices, but the people it mattering to are being poor people, women of color, it's other who have historically not had access to greater resources to give themselves different choices, right? You're essentially going to have to be able to travel to a place where the, means, <laughs> where the, yeah. the law even is that, more forgiving. It just seems, like a, it just seems it's very unfair. But I'm, oh, yeah. I'm so glad that you, you, you took the time with us today. Um, I, 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 these things happen. I often think, oh, what would Mario say about this? Oh, I often say it in my class. And I, this past semester when I taught um, uh, constitutional law to first-year students, yeah, yeah. I taught the set of cases of Roe and Casey and leading up to the, the Dobbs, the Mississippi, and the Texas cases. Yeah. And I said, more than ever, I am concerned that with a supermajority of conservatives on the court um, that we might get some real different uh, it's in the approach to uh to this you know what has been protected um liberty yeah. interest and my students pushed back against me and said but the court would have to abandon so much history and tradition yeah, and respect yeah. for sorry decisis and i'm like and so we'll see what those right, things really mean right, right. um in you know a matter of weeks and and i as soon as the opinion was leaked which is rare within supreme court history yeah. My students who are you know, done with the class start writing me and saying, Professor, wow, this is, you know, and I said that the only thing that gives me hope is that, you know, your generation um, will have both the incentive and the skills um, to respond and to create um, more just <laughs> um, and equitable laws because the, in the end, the court is not the final arbiter, it is the people, right? right and right. so we the people. And so if, if this is something that does not sit well with the majority of a democratic society, we should bring uh, a, a means to bear um, to have a different result. I mean, ultimately we have in the past really leaned on the court yeah. to sort of um, heavily weigh in on in areas where we might not have been ready as a society right, to right. move forward with, but now we might have to rely on ourselves. I, was, I would have loved to have been one of your students during this last six months. <laughs> I don't know I if I so much. That, but, 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 but I would have loved to have you in my, uh, my class. I am sure you would have I, been paying attention. I would have. And, I would have, and, I would have been one of those guys I, in the back row the inter, watching their... I know. <laughs> years ago, Malcolm came to a class when I was teaching at a university yeah. in Florida. And he's like, there were people who are using their computers the other than for... I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so shocked I really wasn't. But, uh, but you know, my... But, my sense is at this time it's more important than ever that yeah. um, the students are engaged because I think if nothing else this opinion shows us that there are real issues that matter in people's lives that are um, up for consideration and reconsideration yeah, yeah. and the fact that outcomes in the past have been consistent uh, with our values and beliefs about the way in which law should operate in our life does not guarantee that they will continue to be so. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on our show. Um, my name is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, California. I'm with Mario Lamont Barnes, law professor at UC Irvine. Irvine. <coughs> thanks for watching. More good news. <laughs>